Hey folks, uh, thanks for having me here today. Uh, I do want to give a quick shout out to the folks with the same logo as myself here in State Parks. I think this is the first meeting where we've had significant representation from the Bureau of State Park staff. And I appreciate you folks coming out today, uh, taking time off your day to day and, and you folks watching online as well. I really probably should have uh, changed the title of this. We have uh, utilizing prescribed fire in state parks, but uh, more of answering the question of why the hell are we using fire in state parks? I think there's a lot of questions out there about using that, this tool and, and why it really makes sense for us. Uh, next slide, please. So I wanna talk a little bit about uh, state parks in general. Uh, I think a lot of folks don't know exactly who we are. Honestly, uh, myself, I started working in private industry. I worked for the Bureau of Forestry for a, a handful of years, and then I jumped over to the Bureau of State Parks. I thought I knew state parks. Uh, really, I, I had a lot to learn when I jumped over into the new Bureau. So uh, a little bit about state parks formation and the, uh, the, the, the mission and how we're actually uh, built. You can click ahead. I got some animations on here that's really not going to get the effect we're shooting for. But uh, so... Long story short, uh, you know, the enabling legislation, you know, 1929, uh, building the uh, Sticks and Cricks, uh, State Parks was part of that. Um, we started to look at uh, Act 18 here uh, from 95. We had that separation of uh, DER into DCNR and DEP. And you'll notice that I got a little bit of highlighted uh, area here in the primary mission of the Department of Conservation After Resources to maintain and improve and preserve state parks. Uh, Preserve, yeah, keep that in the back of your mind. Maintain and improve are the things I really want to focus on today, especially dealing with uh, uh, prescribed fire. And we look at a little bit about state parks, our formation, why we're here, how we're staffed, how we're operating. Uh, it, it doesn't say in, in Act 18 to only maintain the infrastructure of state parks. It says maintain and improve state parks as a whole, as a system. Uh, next slide, please. So here we have our state parks mission and, and what one of the real big takeaways here, and I'm going to get to it later on in, in the program and how I think we can interact better with uh, the prescribed fire council. But uh, one of the big things we have in, in the Bureau of State Parks and one of our big driving emphasis is that they should serve as outdoor classrooms. Uh, we want to we want to use state parks to educate the public, connect those folks to nature, connect them to the resource and help them understand all the things that we're doing out there and why we're doing that. And we have a really good opportunity to do that within the Bureau of State Parks and to reach out and help everybody in this room. And I, I don't wanna push anyone uh, you know, out there, but uh, we, have, we have a great component of educators that can really do a lot of good for us. Next slide, please. Bureau of State Parks, uh, now 124. Uh, you may have seen in the, in the news, we, we added a few more here in this uh, last few months. Uh, good for us. Uh, a lot of a lot of work and a lot of uh, effort goes in uh, to actually putting those parks together and building them up. And it's kind of a neat experience for myself and, and actually all the folks working in state parks. We kind of missed all that early buildup of state parks, and we're kind of on that that maintenance phase. And, and again, pretty infrastructure heavy. But seeing how we're actually going to put these parks together and what it takes to actually stand up a park, and and when that kind of helps us out to, to, to pull that thought process in. It really helps us understand why state parks are structured the way we are and staffed the way we are. We do have a decent sized land base, uh, about 300,000 acres. Uh, we also have uh, quite a bit of recreational water bodies. Uh, so I'm gonna focus on the terrestrial acres. Uh, the big takeaway on this slide is that 42 million visitors annually has a heavy load on our state park system. and we did see a pretty good spike there over the, the thing that happened in uh, 2020 here, that whole COVID uh, deal. Uh, we actually bumped that number up. We were about uh, 50,000 visitors uh, over the, the pandemic years there. Put a pretty heavy strain on, on our operations. But when we look at this actually over the last decade, we've been increasing our, our visitorship uh, due to the good work that, that everyone's, uh, you know, in the system is doing out there. Uh, but I, I think this number is gonna stay high. We're, we're probably anticipating probably sticking around that, that 42, 43 million uh, visitors annually, which, you know, again, 
I will talk about fire eventually, but we start thinking about prescribed fire and the interactions with this council. Uh, we are not hidden. Uh, everything that we do is definitely in the public eye and, and we have a good opportunity to really be seen out there. And, and we, we have to be seen out there. Next slide, please. Uh, yeah, the animation would have been better on this, but uh, each park is its own town. And this was actually explained to me by one of the park managers. I did not realize a lot of this going in. So each park has a mayor, uh, which could be that park manager, uh, assistant park manager, park operations manager, kind of the head of the park. Administrative staff, clerical staff, administrative assistants, purchasing folks, they're in place in every park. Um, so you got that, you know, administrative uh, functions that you see in, in a regular community, whether it be a borough or township. But we also have a police force. Uh, we have quite a few rangers uh, that work out there and we might be setting up some sort of uh, resource management activity, working with one of the law enforcement rangers, and they have to divert and go deal with a domestic dispute in the campground. Uh, that's the kind of things that happen in state parks that we have to be able to, to understand whenever you know we as resource managers start to interact. Uh, we also have a, we have our schools. We have that cadre of environmental educators. Uh, again, state parks are outdoor classrooms. We have 110 environmental educators or folks working in that realm or within the system. Uh, so we have a huge impact and opportunity there. One of the interesting ones is, uh, you know, water, wastewater treatment uh, plant operators. We might be, you know, just because we are remote systems dealing with that wastewater from the campground, or we might literally be treating the outside's waste as well. Yeah, I almost missed stepped on the waste there. Uh, so public works, uh, we have that maintenance staff out there plowing the roads right now, pushing all that snow around, making sure culverts are flowing, making sure, sure that everyone has access, making sure that our buildings aren't gonna fall in around us. So we have all those components, but going back to that 300,000 acre land base, the thing you don't see on this slide that's in every one of these towns and every one of these parks is someone focused on resource management. Um, whether it was overlooked as we were getting staffed up or, or however that starts to play, there's only three folks that are focused on terrestrial land management and the Bureau of State Parks. So if we break that down and look at our, our seven and a half hour day or eight hour day, however you wanna look at it, we would really be spending about 10 minutes per park in our workload. That's, that's really, if we would be you know, looking at, at this town here, I should be given that town about 10 minutes of my average work day. So how much are we really going to get done in that 10 minutes? So it's, there's a prioritization scheme that needs to come into play here. And, and again, I'll start talking about fire and how that plays in. So next slide, please. Oh yeah, there is animation. It just was terrible on my setup. So you have these towns that are, you know, uh, Point State Park, a uh, very small town, uh, 30, 36, 37 acres or so. Downtown Pittsburgh, if you watch Channel 4 News, if you're on my side of the mountain, that's what you see as soon as that thing pops up there. Um, you know, a lot of heavy visitorship. Not a whole lot of uh, opportunities for prescribed fire in uh, downtown Pittsburgh, but you look at places like Cook Forest where we have, uh, you know, a bunch of old growth and natural areas. And, and this, this slide that's staying up front here is, is our environmental education folks. Uh, they're teaching program and they're helping people connect to that resource. We can bump to the next slide and the next slide. So out of that 300,000 acres, about 98% of that is classified as some sort of a forest, whether early successional, just uh, reverting farmland, shrublands, or old growth forest that we're going to find up. It, it, it cooks uh, forest there. So when we look at, you know, this is uh, Blue Knob State Park. We don't see a lot of infrastructure there. However, all of our staff is really focused on that infrastructure component. So 98% of that land is not infrastructure, yet 0% of our staff is actually focused on natural resources alone. And I'm not, not to say that every you know, state park individual, there is a component of natural resource in their day-to-day -day work, um, but their primary focus and why they were hired was not um, due to the direct tie of uh, natural resource maintenance or management. So next slide, please. So how we kind of got here when we're, and we're seeing this now as we're standing up these parks, it's helping the, um, I guess I can't consider myself a young person anymore. That, that ship sailed a little while ago, but uh, 
were our early pioneers of state parks. Those folks that were in there in the, in the 20s, 30s, and the 70s, you know, we had an 80s uh, when they're standing up a bunch of these parks. Uh, you know, we were growing that forest back. Uh, and that's that's what, what our focus was. We had to get some infrastructure on the ground. We had to create this creature conference uh, for folks to come out and recreate and visit our state parks. So that's how our staff was formed. That's how our staff was focused for the long, longest period. And and it wasn't until really recently that we started to see that maybe that's not exactly uh, the best solution for us and the best way to serve the, the Commonwealth. And you can bump to the next slide. And the next slide. So you see, you know, we, we this is what folks start to think about in state parks. You know, we've got cabins, we've got campgrounds, we've got all this creature conference. There's a concession by the beach. You know, you can get the kids some ice cream uh, and, and all that good stuff. But we want to really focus on why those folks are out at state parks and why they're recreating there. And it's due to that connection to nature. They're, they're getting away. And we learned this in the pandemic at a Actually, we didn't learn. We got hammered in on us so you folks can speak directly to this. But uh, those folks that were coming out and connecting to nature, uh, it was found to be pretty important. Uh, so we were actually one of those, um, you know, organizations uh, that was allowed to continue our business uh, when everybody was was feeling a little bit uh, out of sorts and going through all that stuff. So. All of, all of these started to play into a hands-off approach for the, the natural resource management side of things. And it, it translated to a lot of our staff is, no, no, we don't do that out there. We, we fix the road, we build the cabin, we work on the cottages, we make sure that we have this stuff here, that the toilets flush and the toilets are clean. Our staff started to lose that understanding of the outdoors and, and, and the need to actually manage and maintain the outdoors. Uh, you know, the, the old adage, you know, green is good. As long as it's green out there, people are happy, life is good. But we'll see in the next few slides here that we've got our problems with what's growing out there in green. Next slide, please. So just like everybody else, uh, you know, we've got your, your interesting forest uh, conditions. Insects and disease, invasive plants, a lot of the ecological imbalances. We start to talk about wildlife population imbalances. I won't say the word deer, but we have a lot of imbalances there. And, and due to the way parks are set up, uh, you know, we're our own little small town. That might be the only patch of area for those wildlife to be entertaining. So that carrying capacity, th those issues are compounded heavily on that reserve of land. So we're impacted very heavily on that. But the next is the, the lack of diversity in species, age, and structure of our forest. Uh, that's something that we really weren't thinking about even five, 10 years ago. Um, but we're starting to really get our hands around the concept and really starting to think about the diversity of our forest, the resiliency of our forest, because go ahead and click please. Uh, climate change makes all this stuff worse. Next slide. So yeah, we've got invasive species. We've got lots of it. Um, depending on where you're at, we've got even more of it. Uh, sometimes we'll be out there and we'll treat the stilt grass <laughs> just to make way for the next batch of stuff that's gonna grow. Uh, usually it's not too, too good. Next slide, please. We also have a lot of degraded forests. Uh, whenever, you know, we, we either, whatever land acquisition mechanism was used to, to acquire a parcel, um, you know, we, we got so, yes, but really good land here, folks. DC and our state parks, you're gonna want this stuff. And um, yeah, yeah, it's, it's something. Uh, we, we can do something out there eventually. We have a lot of these degraded forests that are, you know, full of invasive species. Uh, they, they could have been, harvested with uh, less than than adequate or less than professional means. Uh, so we have a lot of, of areas that, uh, you know, are not growing what we need to be growing and they're not on a trajectory to do what we need them to do to stay in an ecological balance. Next slide, please. So it wasn't till about uh, 2019 when we started actually collecting real data on our forest lands and fully understanding what was going on with those conditions. We, we had some cursory studies, we had some, some general uh, uh, vegetation typing, plant community classifications, but it, it was really sketchy at best. Uh, some of it you know, even the, the sketchy information was going on 30 years old when uh, the three field service specialists were hired into the Bureau of State Parks. So we didn't have a lot of data to start with and to go with. So we need to start gathering that data. And this, uh, 
this is just uh, this is Ohio Pile State Park. Uh, we had a, a dynamic forest restoration block plan done. Yes, State Parks is looking at actual forest management plans. We're we're looking at directly managing that forest for uh, for the ecological benefit of the Commonwealth, and, and we want to really look at what kind of trajectory our forests are on and what tools we're going to need to actually set that trajectory in, in a good point. Uh, so we started to see that that you know oaks are dropping out. Uh, just like a lot of your stands, you're probably seeing the same thing. You know, we're starting to see this replacement of other species. We're seeing a lot of these other species become a major component or potential future component in our forest stands. And even in Ohio piles, really interesting because we have these interesting areas where farmers, or I should say, early pioneers of Fayette County. If anyone knows about Fayette County, it's a it's a good county, Barb. It's awesome. Uh, it's it's a little rough, uh, a little rough around the edges at times, and and it's good because that that hardiness is what we're looking for down there. But folks decided they, you know, the wagon broke down there, and this is where we're going to set the homestead and start to farm on these rocky ridge tops. And uh, you you really wonder as they're reverting back into state park land why we have poplar growing on these rocky ridge tops. Uh, we have a lot of poplar, red maple, black birch, uh, not the species that we would normally uh, associate up there. And it has to do with a lot of that, that, that past land management and the lack of some of those environmental factors that would normally drive the species that we should generally be seeing up there on those ridges. So we're starting to see that we've got some problems out there. So we have a, what are we, about five, six, forest management plans, I think forest restoration plans out there now. And we're starting to see a huge problem. Uh, that This is not just a one location scenario, which in this room, we already all know that, but we need the data to support that. So we can start to make some inferences on what that's gonna look like across the, the system of state parks. Next slide, please. Oh, can we go back just a couple more? Uh, we have one more back there. Okay, this can go to, so even early on, this was, I think, in the, this was early 2000s. I'm going to use Blue Knob because this was one of the first locations where we were starting to look at prescribed fire as a potential um, solution or a potential tool to our problem. And this was actually done by Western Pennsylvania Conservancy. Uh, so they did some, some plant community classification work, trying to help us out figuring out, you know, where some of our problem areas may be. And this is dense pockets of striped maple. Uh, so pretty much we have, and, and Alex, see you here, you know, you walk through Blue Knob State Park and you've got some really pretty country You've got some really interesting, you know, plant communities, but then in this thick understory of, of striped maple, and, and it's a really complex problem that, that we run into in parks because a lot of our folks think that that is perfectly natural and, and beautiful. And, and it's, you know, striped maple, it's that native species, but it's definitely showing us that we have some imbalances out there that we can really start to put into check. And we're getting really close to fire with this one. Okay, so next slide, please. So what's not the love? Like, why would any forester not want to go out and work for the state parks? You know, we have an ag agency that's heavy to infrastructure. You know, we have three folks that are focused on forest or on, uh, on, on the natural resource management out there. Due to a lot of, the, you know, the, the buildup of state parks. So we've got this legacy issue that we've been historically opposed to active management. And that goes for it. I know when I jumped into state parks, you know, hearing from park managers, like, we can't cut that tree down. I know you just told me it's a hazard, but we have to get authority and approval to get that tree cut down. Holy smokes, what are you guys thinking here? It's crazy. And there's, you know, there's a lot of forest land to manage, but it's a lot of it is degraded. And a lot of it's not set in a trajectory that's going to go where we need it to go or want it to go for the benefit of the Commonwealth. And we've got these legacy issues of fire exclusion. And, and I will say that the, the missed opportunities, and, and I think Early on in the Bureau of State Park, I say the first meeting up here was in 2004, 2005. I think there was one resource manager assigned to the Bureau of State Parks at that point. Um, she may have been just coming in at, at that point. We may have had zero folks that were focused on uh, natural resources in the Bureau of State Parks and, and that early in the 2000s. And uh, the big thing to think about from a state parks perspective is these these species these these species that we're losing that are starting to blink out of, of using our state parks the habitats aren't available there anymore uh, the, the the 
plant species that are blinking out and they're, they're doing it on our watch. Uh, this is that we have the, the technology and we have the understanding. We know what we need to do yet. We're just watching them blink out. We're not doing anything about that. Not that we're not trying. Uh, don't, don't, the, the wheels of government turn slow. Most of you folks that are working in government here know, know how that, that ship turns really slow. Uh, but, but they are happening on our watch. And that's something that you know, I personally don't find acceptable. And I know most of you folks are passionate about resource management in here. You don't accept that as well, not on your watch. Next slide, please. So we do have a paradigm in our thought process in the Bureau of State Parks. Uh, we've, we've made a huge corner here in the last, I wanna say the last three to four years of, of really setting an understanding that we need to do something different. Uh, what we're doing currently is not doing justice to those resources uh, of the Commonwealth. And a lot of this was spurred on by NIFWF funding. Uh, we received a few NIFWF grants uh, where we were able to start getting these forest management plans, get some implementation on the ground, wrap our hands around the understanding that we have some, some issues out there. And in these dynamic forest restoration plans, uh, uh, I don't know if uh, Larkin's out there in the audience or watching online. Thank you very much for your support in this. Uh, we've had meetings with our executive staff and, and a huge emphasis to change uh, the trajectory of our forest lands in the Bureau of State Parks. The leadership now you know, they acknowledge the need for active resource management. Uh, and that is something that you probably would not have heard about 10 years ago in, in the Bureau of State Parks. I, I know myself when I was working in a different agency and I would go to a state park to suggest something or, hey, I've got this uh, this neighbor here and maybe we should do something over. It was, it was a non-starter. You just didn't get to even have that conversation at that time. But we're, we're changing things. We're, we're making life a lot better now. And... <laughs> We have to really think about, you know, from resource management, our perspective on how are we going to change the, the, the state parks and, and, the, and the vegetation in state parks and that natural resource focus in state parks with such a limited staff. We're, we're not getting more staff. They're not going to just give us a whole bunch more people to come out and do resource management in the Bureau of State Parks. It would be great if that happened, but it's just not going to happen that way. We do have about 500 or so employees in the Bureau. I think that's all pretty much on the salary component. Um, but those folks were set up and, and, and again, building parks. That's, that's what we were doing historically and, and maintaining the infrastructure that we just built. That's, that's kind of what the focus was. So when we got this resource management uh, section stood up and started thinking about what, what are those things that we can do to make major changes in the trajectory of our forest resource on the Bureau? Next slide, please. I want to start looking at, at, at the multifaceted approach to, to forest management. So we have prescribed fire out there. We have app, uh, herbicide, herbicide applications. Uh, you know, all of this stuff plays into what we need to be to do to change the tide of the resources in the Bureau. Next slide, please. So why use fire? We actually have fire in a lot of our early management plans. Uh, we had, uh, this is a, a document from the Western Pennsylvania Conservancy that actually suggests using fire for our striped maple issue out there in Blue Knob. Uh, you can go through all these. It's Everybody in this room knows that prescribed fire is a good thing in the right scenarios. I don't need to go over that all again. And, and us in the Bureau of State Parks, we're not blind to that fact either. Uh, that is a tremendous management tool, especially, you know, as, as we look about where our land is positioned uh, across the Commonwealth. Uh, we, we know from these resources that and there is, there, there's a huge research gap. Uh, we, we're still learning more, especially in our Eastern forest, but we know from the information we have at hand right now, prescribed fire is a very useful tool. And it's a tool that we can use in the Bureau of State Parks quite effectively without adding more staff to the situation. Next slide, please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. keep going. Next slide, please. The other thing was controlled burns prescribed fire. It's not new to the Bureau of State Parks. Um, thank you, Will, for this slide. You've got the DER patch there. This is back in the, I believe, 8081. Uh, this, is, this is what we were doing in Jennings. Uh, this is 
Uh, this is the predecessor to, to the prescribed fire program that has been operational at, at Jennings uh, Environmental Education Center. Pre-1980, I think the Western Pennsylvania Conservancy, uh, I believe there's records from the 60s, 60, 60, 61, uh, where we were burning this small relic prairie because of all the species of, of, of conservation need and rare threatened endangered species on Jennings Environmental Education Center and actually largely out into uh, Moraine State Park, that 98% number is probably growing in that 16 acre relic prairie. Um, there's a lot of cool stuff in there. There's a lot of interesting stuff in there. And it's cool and interesting because it's a relic prairie. Um, this, is, this is one of those things that it's, it's, it's unique uh, and it's unique to us. And it's something that we knew you know, back then that we need to manage. But fire in state park, it was generally, you know, we have small areas. Uh, you know, the prairie, it was, it was still 16 or so acres back then. Uh, you know, it was probably much larger than that earlier on, but that's what, uh, what was left of it uh, whenever we were able to start working in there. And we looked across state parks and, and when fire was being used, it was generally just small areas, uh, demonstration plots, things like that, not as uh, generally widespread and at scale as we would like to see. And again, I, I think there were some, some missed opportun opportunities at the onset uh, of the prescribed fire council. I think we had some pos potential back then uh, to really have the program up and running and really start to, to move, but, but again, you know, 10, 20 years ago, state parks wasn't quite thinking in this direction. So, um, you know, we missed some opportunities then, but now it's time to start looking at things a little bit differently and changing. Uh, next slide, please. So, so bring a more fire back to uh, state parks. Uh, the, the key was that we were, were different than, than, than everyone sitting out here. And, and each agency sitting out here is a little bit different than the agency you're sitting beside. That's, that's not anything earth shattering. But these differences, uh, they, they pose some operational obstacles that we'll get to in the next slide. And, and we need to think about that, you know, let's take those differences and kind of separate those and put those off to the side uh, and really think about what we have in common and how we can build off of those common practices, those common policies to actually advance the, the work that we need to do out there. Uh, go ahead and pop the animation up there. And, and the big thing is, you know, we're, we're not trying to recreate the wheel. Um, you folks have been doing this for a long time. You folks know what you're doing. Uh, we're not going to recreate the wheel, but we're going to steal the crap out of all the good stuff that you're doing and use it on our lands as well. Next, Dan. So some, some obstacles that, that, that we run into is, you know, staff buy-in and, and all of you folks sitting out there were probably sitting here 20 years ago saying the same exact thing. How are we gonna get everybody on board? No one's gonna go for this. What the heck are you thinking? And we need that staff buy-in at the, at the executive level, the whole way down to, to the individual, that firefighter type two, that's actually coming out to that prescribed burn. Prescribed fire days are wildfire days. Uh, so, so our sister agency is, is tasked with, with wildfire suppression in the Commonwealth. Um, state parks is not, but you know, building, building this workout, you know, we can definitely have some folks that are available at that point in time to, to help. Uh, burn day on state parks is also a burn day for other agencies. So, you know, if we're burning with, with a partner, uh, you know, they've probably got units available too. So we want to think about what's going to be available for those folks. And, and do we have enough staff to get around to everything uh, that we want to get burned in that, in that scenario? A uh, big thing that we're running into in state parks is just generally resources alone, uh, bucks and boots. So funds and staff. Uh, we're not getting a line item budget for prescribed fire in the Bureau of State Parks. Uh, maybe someday, not right now. Staff, uh, you've seen kind of what our staff does in our small little town. Each one of those little towns doesn't shut down because we're going to go burn somewhere that day. Uh, all those functions, the, the wastewater treatment plant needs to be balanced and running. Uh, you need to make sure that you have law enforcement available for whatever goes on in the park. You need to have all those things available, but we also want that staff to shift over and, and, and help us burn. Public perception and lack of education is something I, I can't believe or, you know, 20 some years into this. And, and there are a lot of folks in the general public that don't understand prescribed fire, why we're doing prescribed fire. And, and we need to really get out there and, and, and emphasize why we're doing this. 
Uh, next slide, please. So adapt and overcome. Uh, agencies, you know, we have to be able to burn our own land. So we cannot rely on somebody else to come in and do it for us. One, it's, it's not really good cooperation. It's not being a good partner, uh, but we really need to, to understand we got to be able to, to stand on our own and maybe it's a small unit. Maybe we're, we're, we're going to need that assistance for these larger units, but we need to have something available so we can keep on moving. Leaders come from every job classification in the Bureau of State Parks. So we have, we have clerks on the burn crew. We have environmental educators on the burn crew. We have regional managers on the burn crew. And, and it's a really good opportunity to see how those folks can advance from fire line leadership to being better leaders in their own individual park slash town. Partnerships are, are key and cannot be one side. Yikes. Uh, anyhow, uh, so partnerships uh, can't be one sided. Uh, early on, you know, we we're looking at, at, at being a partner and a cooperator in prescribed fire. Uh, we, we have to be able to bring something to the table. Just inviting everyone to come burn on state parks is not the solution. Uh, and we want to be able to, to, to learn from, from what's going on out there. In this picture, this was our first woods burn in um, uh, the Bureau of State Parks. And you can kind of see the different colored helmets. Uh, there's Game Commission, there's State Parks and Game Commission State Parks. We're learning from the, the skills and, 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 and knowledge that's out there and already being utilized uh, on the on the prescribed fire world. Uh, so, so we get a chance to educate ourselves, uh, but educate, educate, educate means we need to get our educators involved to actually get out there and talk about prescribed fire to the public. Next slide. So big thing, getting staff trained. Um, I undershot this one when we first started going. We need probably about 2X or 3X staff trained for what we actually need to, to deploy to the fire ground. Again, that staff has other stuff to do too. Um, not every burn day can they pull out. So sometimes, yeah, uh, we can get some folks to, to come out. Uh, and, you know, they can push some stuff off to the side. But uh, if that's the only ranger on duty that day, guess what? They're not coming to help us out. They still got to take care of that stuff at the park. Um, so getting our staff trained, and that, that goes, again, working with partners. Uh, this is a, a Bureau of Forestry. The guys were able to get us some entry-level training, uh, working with, with other partners to get staff trained. Uh, next slide, please. And, and, and we, we don't want to go at it alone. Uh, it's lonely out on the island, uh, but we want to be a, a cooperator, a partner uh, with, with everybody out there, especially the, the, the folks in this room. We want to learn from our partners, we want to train with our partners. Uh, this is a, a thank you folks, uh, Southwest Region, the Game Commission. We were able to get a joint uh, RT-130 together. Uh, focus on a little bit of uh, medical uh, operations, uh, able to uh, bring the aircraft in and give everyone some, some training on, on that. It's really interesting to see uh, from, from myself kind of sitting back and watching how the integration of staff, uh, seeing the folks start to come together and start to gel as a team from different agencies, completely different walks of life in, in most scenarios, uh, but we start to see how that starts to come together for us. And, and partnership, again, I can't emphasize it enough, and, and this is kind of a selling point in our bureau, is that, that the partnership, you've got to be an active participant in that. Uh, next slide, please. We have to execute. Uh, learned early on uh, that support wanes pretty quickly when you're not burning. Uh, when you set something up and we get a whole bunch of staff trained and then we don't execute any kind of fire, uh, that, that support starts to wane, not only from the individuals, because they're getting bored, but also from the, the folks that are footing the bill for the training saying, why are we training all these people for not doing it? Um, so so we got to get out there and execute. Logistics, always a challenge in state parks. Uh, just our general layout and the way we're, we're set up is a, is a little bit different. Um, but we don't want to shy away from our high visitation areas. This is a, a Keystone State Park. Uh, I think all in told, this burns only about an acre, uh, but you would not believe the, the engagement we get from the public whenever we burn this, this, uh, this meadow at, at Keystone State Park. Um, we don't wanna hide this, we wanna get out there. And because we wanna get out there, this next slide should uh, get us there. And uh, we'll get there eventually. Uh, so. We'll wrap up in a little while here, but um, one of the things that is a challenge for us is, is really 
a reasonable concept to success. What does success look like? And, and does prescribed fire get us there? And it's, it's not a silver bullet. It's a tool in the toolbox for sure. Um, but, but I, I had a trouble, you know, from, from, from a program management standpoint, you know, what is the appropriate metric to document our, you know, are we getting better at this? Are we doing more of this? And, and acres doesn't always fit. Uh, units completed doesn't always fit. Sometimes, you know, and I, and I will say this, uh, I, sorry, Will, I call you out on every single uh, fire uh, training we do, but burning four acres at Jennings Prairie might have the most ecological impact of that staff uh, for that day or for that entire month. Um, that, that area is so important uh, to, to maintaining the, the vegetation and, and the things that use that vegetation, that that four acres may be the most freaking important thing that we do all year. Uh, from a resource management standpoint, because of the things that are located there. So being able to understand that, and I'd love to pick, pick your brains out there on, uh, you know, what metrics make the most sense for us, because there's not a one size fits all here. I'll go to the next slide, please. The big key that state parks is bringing to the table is this 110 educational staff. Uh, I think there's something that really needs to be said there, you know, from, from a council standpoint. And now that, now that we've roped you all into coming, uh, now you got to start talking to the board of directors to figure out how you're going to fit that communications piece, how you're going to get that outreach piece. Because, you know, we want to, we, one, we encourage our educational staff to come out and be part of that burn crew. So they get that firsthand knowledge of prescribed fire and that understanding of prescribed fire. But on all of our prescribed burns, we actually have them assigned somewhere in that incident management team. Um, they're on that IEP. They could be a public information officer or they're just available to the burn boss whenever we start to gather a crowd uh, to go talk to those people. And it really means a lot when they go talk to those folks, uh, you know, in their Nomex where they're coming out of the smoke and actually engaging those folks. Uh, so I think it's a really important uh, portion for us, you know, yeah, yeah, public information's officer doesn't quite fit the environmental education specialist. There's so much more that can be offered um, from these, these, these trained educators that, that can be brought to the table. And that goes for any agency in this council. Um, and it's a, a, it's a tremendous resource for the, the fire community from an outreach perspective. You know, we're, I say we have 300,000 acres. That's not a huge, that's like a one forest district for crying out loud. But when you really look at how we're spaced out, you know, one park within every 25 miles of every Pennsylvania. And so we're scattered across there. We have the ability to reach those folks. So I asked everyone in this council to kind of reach out to us to how we can kind of integrate into your process as well. I think there's an opportunity there. And then, you know, looking at, at how state parks are housed and staffed, you know, out across there, when you're burning, don't, don't be afraid at this point to look at, at state parks as a contingency resource, pick up the phone and, and see what you're doing. I, I look over at, at Neil here and, you know, uh, that four or five o'clock in the morning, hey, what'd you guys see yesterday? How'd it go? Um, hey, we're thinking about this over here. We've got similar conditions. Uh, you know, what, what were your objectives? You know, how, how are you meeting those? Was everything working out all right? That communication is super helpful. And, and as we grow as a Bureau of State Parks and have these folks plugged in across the, the Commonwealth, I think it'll be a tremendous resource to plug into that fire network in the Commonwealth uh, to really get those communications back and forth. Next slide, please. Yep, fire management's not easy. Everyone knows that. Next slide. Let's go through all these animations here. I just want to close with, with these two things. I know I'm, I'm running up against the wall here, but this council is a fantastic opportunity. Uh, when, I, when I first came over to state parks, I was kind of him hauling around about the need to actually come out to the council meetings. But I, I will say, and for you folks that are, you know, looking at building your agencies and building your programs, you know, listening to speakers you know, other than myself is actually a very worthwhile uh, time spent. But the conversation out in the hallway over a cup of coffee between a sister agency or someone that's going through something similar um, than in your burn program is probably the most valuable asset. I, I love the concept. There's a, a social going on where folks can network and really get some discussions going. But um, don't overlook the fact that uh, everybody's at this meeting. Um, trying to schedule a freaking Teams meeting or something on an Outlook calendar is about impossible. But everybody that you need to talk to is right here today or 
online today. So use these opportunities to really network and, and talk to these folks to figure out where your program can get some benefit and help. And I really just want to emphasize again that, that partnerships and cooperation, if we want to look at, at, at landscape layout, uh, scale opportunities, you know, the, these, the, these opportunities to work with partners, and that's how you see a lot of other states cooperating, um, you know, whether it's, it's with their game and fish departments and, and, and DERs, and uh, you have a chance to talk to these other practitioners out there. And uh, there's a huge opportunity here in Pennsylvania to operate that landscape scale. And I think doing that through cooperation and partnerships, you know, brought together by this council is an absolute uh, perfect recipe for success. Next slide, please. And that's it. 